Calypso, Michael Jackson, Rihanna, Lady Gaga, Madonna, Lady Gaga. Did I say that already? <laughs> Taylor Swift. Is there anything off limits? No. What kind of pressure do you experience working with all these uh, incredible, famous, famous artists? Don't know that I experience any pressure at all, actually. I think I was very fortunate because I worked with Madonna at a, at a point at which she was super famous, but I didn't know she was super famous because my pop culture experience at that point had been very limited, being living in Singapore with no TV and no internet, no computers, none of that back in the day, and then living in LA at USC, going to school, focusing on school with no TV and no internet and none of that as well. I really didn't have any kind of attention on people being famous. So the people that I fanboyed over were really only like Sheila E and Prince, you know, maybe Bjork at one point. How has Hollywood changed since you were 17? Oh my God. <laughs> it was a very different space. And now it doesn't feel like there, it, that sort of LA doesn't even exist anymore. People think, oh, it's so weird and rough. And it's like, no, <laughs> when I first got here, like, you know, it was the, the, the height of gang warfare. Um, there were shootings happening, carjackings. Um, downtown was like a no-go zone. Even police didn't go there at night. It was like they just picked up the bodies in the morning. It was it was scarier, a much scary place, scarier place than it is now, certainly. What year was that? Nineteen forty-two. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, <laughs> no, no. um, that was nineteen eighty-seven. 88, 87, 88. Could you describe what it was like in your childhood home? Um, it was very, it was varied is probably the best way to say it. I, my mom was young, she was 22, I think when she had me and she wanted to finish school. So, you know, she, I was with my grandmother a lot and with the babysitter a lot. And then she decided to go back to school and finish her degree. And she sent me off to live with my great grandmother and great aunts in Michigan. Um, and so I was surrounded by love, but a very mature love. I definitely felt like the golden child. They showered their love on me. And so I was very fortunate in that. Um, it feels odd to say that I preferred it that way because people think, oh, you need your mom and your dad. And it's like, but I had all this love around me. What, what was I missing? Yeah. Do you think that um, having that mature love around you changed your perspective on life in general? The biggest takeaway I got from that entire experience was really from my great aunt, Jessie. And she instilled in me this very intentional appreciation of nature and life. And she would go out of her way to make sure that I observed the small details around me. Like, look at this leaf. Look at the veins in the leaf. Look yes. how it's feeding every part of the leaf. Look at the shape of the leaf. Isn't that divine? She would have me look in the clouds and then ask me how many colors I saw and to name them, point them out. I really treasure now that I, of course I didn't know that any different. I remember being delighted, but I didn't realize how special all of that was until I've you know, seen everyone else's upbringings and youth and everything. And I'm like, wow, I was given such access to fantasy and uh, Im Im improvised beauty, improvised joy. The practice of appreciation is extraordinary and it, it, it it, it's a it's an absolute gift. When I'm present and aware of it and, and, and cognizant of it and I practice it, it changes my life. Always. Always. Thank you, Aunt Jessie. <laughs> Thank you, Aunt Jessie. Great Aunt Jessie. Are you are you in love with your work? Uh, no. <laughs> I love working. I'm not in love with my work. When it really becomes work and it's stressful and difficult, that's usually when I start turning off. Yeah. You know, I mean, I, I, will, I will see things through to the end because I'm aware that of my integrity around me saying yes to a job. If I've said yes to something and I'm committed to it, I wanna stay committed to it. There's only been a handful of times that I've stepped out of a job. And I think only once where I kind of stepped out inelegantly, um, but uh, I've always tried to give my 100% no matter where, what's happening or what's going on and try to make the best out of the situation. No matter what the circumstances are around me, I'm not a victim of my circumstances. So if I wanna have fun, it can also be my responsibility to create fun. It's not about other right. people trying to make me have a good time, treat me right so then I have a good time. It's not about so then.
It's about what am I doing to generate fun? How am I participating mm -hmm. in this that's going to make it fun? I work a lot because I think I try to bring joy every to my job. And I, I have a wonderful time and I love seeing my friends. That quality came across, I picked that up and, and doing some research on you. You seem so capable. And it's like you, you feel like you have the ability to affect the situation you're in and not just accept what you walk into. But almost like you want to boost where you are. Thankfully, with my experience with Madonna and, and my lawsuit with all of that, you know, where she didn't pay us correctly for the movie and we sued and the whole bit and got paid because that was, it was the right thing. We didn't ask for anything else but what we were already supposed to be given. Um, but from that, I was given the ability to speak up on behalf of myself and others in a very straightforward way. I heard a quote one time about um, a, hus uh, uh, let's see. a hustler mentality is about generating money and an entrepreneur's mentality is about generating value. Mm. And that's, they're different things. And it, hasn't, it often doesn't have anything to do with money until later. Um, and I, I'm always focused on value. What, what is in it for you, for the production, for myself? Um, and the money is secondary. It's important, but it's not the number one. That's an important distinction. Well, you'll miss right. out on value and opportunity if you're just focused on the money. Like I've said, yes, I've said yes on so many things that had no money attached, but the value will last a lifetime. And that's one of the biggest lessons I've learned over this life of gypsy life of job to job to job to job is that it doesn't help me to be stressed about it or to worry about it. All that serves me is to move forward, move forward with delight and joy and happy and be happy with what I'm doing and be happy where I am, not be upset about what I'm not having, not be upset about what I'm missing, what I think I should have, how good they're doing, how good I'm, how not good I'm doing, how they're being a star or I'm not being a star because it, none of that matters. None of it matters. And I've had lots of opportunities to continue being super famous over here and super famous in Italy and all this stuff. And it didn't, it didn't turn me on. It didn't, it didn't feed my soul. It didn't do anything for me. And I'm, I'm glad I didn't do it. And I'm happy that other people have had that success and that, that wonderfulness. Like, but like, I, I'm very clear that the level of stardom that you see these people, oh, I wish I was that star. They've paid a price, a very hefty price. And it, there's so few of them that can maintain their, their real heart and their real soul throughout their lives and, and have that level of stardom. It, there's a, a really heavy cost. And some of them find that, that, that groundedness later on, but it's a heavy, heavy cost. Who do you turn to, to share joy with and to share your excitement with? Well, that was always my grandmother, my yeah. grandma Betty. When you do go in public, I, mean, I consider you to be an icon in your profession. When people approach you, strangers that, that know you from your work, how do you receive the uh, compliments and the, you know, the love they give you? Well, that's been a lifelong journey <laughs> right there. I mean, that is a big, very big question. How do you receive love? You know, that's even just in general in life, how you receive love from a stranger coming to is how you receive love from everyone else too. In the, in the 90s, a lot of the people that came to me, approached me, were often talking about Madonna. And because of the lawsuit and because of everything that happened between us, I always thought of these compliments as coming from them to her, not really to me, to her through me, you know. Um, and so I kind of, I really dismissed a lot of it and I, I really sort of brushed a lot of it off. I think I didn't take it to heart um, until, until Strike a Pose came out. Um, and that, once I started traveling around the world with that movie and seeing these thousands of people coming up to us and saying, you changed our lives by being represented, by being seen, just by being happy and successful on camera and having talent and being so diverse and being out loud and proud, which I wasn't necessarily out loud and proud at the time. I was questioning out loud and proud, <laughs> questioning proud and loud. Um, but uh, it really had me reinterpret 30 years of comments from people. 
like I, it really had me sit back and, and like really take it in. I think there were a lot of tearful moments in these, in these theaters watching the movie with these people because it, not just because of remembering our story and remembering Gabriel and, you know, and our bond together, but also just because God, I've been dismissing so much love. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. I, I, yeah. I feel so honored that I can, I can just literally, if I need a boost, I can just flip back through my messages <laughs> or something like <laughs> I, I get the most amazing. Here's a, a really wonderful one. I got this girl, Corrine was in New York waitressing at a bar. She just moved to New York. She had no money. Me and the other dancers were there for the tour and we walked in and we were just chatting, chatting, chatting. And, and she was a big Madonna fan. And so I gave her my tickets and mm -hmm. It was one of those New York moments where she's like, I don't have any money, but I'm in New York. And here suddenly I have like, you know, friends and family tickets to the show, like the biggest show of the year. And um, and then she said, she said after that, she said, I just want you to know that that act of kindness has stayed with me my entire life. And I always try to give it back and pay it forward for your kindness. And I was like, God damn, <laughs> the little mm. things you do can can generate, you know, on and on. I don't know why that moves me so much. <laughs> um, wow. That really moved me. To reach out to me after, you know, after 30 years to tell me that, you know, that has really touched me. I'm so proud of you. That's amazing. And we don't know at that time. You know, <laughs> I don't know what we're doing. It's like, here, here, joyful waitress, here, have some tickets. <laughs> I don't know. So you're not giving yourself credit. I, you're putting that into the world. And you know you're consciously aware of what you put into your environment. I think you may have had an idea of what you were doing. I am, I am more so now than, again, more so now than ever. I think the process of becoming older is often the process of just becoming more and more present to the way things actually are and to who you're being out in the world and to what your impact is. Um, yeah. I mean, sometimes it's a little, sometimes you retreat, <laughs> but I think in the best case scenario <laughs> is that you, yeah. you get more, more present to the beauty of the world, how precious life is, how little time yeah. you have, how much love there is and, and how much impact you can have. The accomplishments, I think, are the things that give you recognition. You know, people learn about you. They learn your name. They recognize your face because of your accomplishments. But getting to know you is what's interesting to me. So thank you for answering those questions. Those are the most meaningful. Could you tell me maybe one of your roles that you've played as a dancer or in another type of job that has been really fulfilling for you? Yes. Uh, I was one of the leads in this show called The Question. We only ran for six days. Uh, me and Jennifer Hamilton were the two leads. And they, they tried to turn it into a movie, all these other things. Um, I've never been asked to carry a live show before. Um, and it was an amazing challenge. It was an amazing gift to me. Uh, for him to believe in me that much. That was uh, J.T. Hornstein out in New York. And the story basically revolved around a couple who I had proposed to this girl. She didn't want to marry me, and she left the restaurant, which I think this is actually based on a real story from J.T.'s experience in, in, uh, as a juror. And there was another thing going on outside. And as she ran outside, and I'm chasing her, kind of mad that she's turning me down, she's shot and killed. But people don't see that. And they just see that I'm over her dead body. And, mm -hmm. and then I'm you know, taken into court, and there's a jury, and blah, 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 and, and mm. executed. Um, all this time, and it wasn't, and it wasn't me. You know. right. But in this in this process this was right after my grandmother had died so you know it was like i i went and did rent uh right like right after like a couple months after she passed i was i was traveling and i went to do rent and then right after rent was when this happened um 
during rent, I didn't really have any healing. I was around friends, so I had support. Um, but the process of doing this show, The Question, gave me the healing that I need, needed to move forward. Um, because in that moment where she dies in front of me, I got to mourn. Mm, I can picture the whole thing. It was beautiful. What a creative you did a fantastic job. Well, I think you know why you took the took the role now. You know, took the job. Jeez, if you could heal from that. Oh, I mean, I had no idea that it was going to put me through that until I was in it, and I was like, wow, like I could just just being around it and and that cathartic process every night. You know, because I I always put my language and my communication into my work, and so. And it's, a, and it's truth. I, I, put, I try to put truth into it. So it's not like I'm just, I'm pretending to, ha, ha, ha. No, I'm actually going through it. And so every night I would go through it and then come out the other side. And not even just like, oh, I'm fine. It was like, I also got to express my frustration and powerlessness and my frustration and my powerlessness. <laughs> and, um, you know, because there's this whole process of jury. Oh, God, I just, I just didn't realize why it was even more difficult for me was because I had to choose uh, basically to let my grandmother die because um, she was ailing and wishing, saying, please pray for me to go quickly. And she wasn't. And every time I said, well, I'm going to go away for a minute and come back, her vitals would crash. So she... And then every time I came back, she, her vitals would rise. So she was basically staying there for me. I had to choose to leave, to let her go quickly. And she was getting past the point of my ability to take care of her. And so in a split second, I had to make that choice. Do, do I take her to the home or do I stick around and stay here while she's suffering and it's past the point where I can take care of her? And I said, I have to, I have to take her, I have to send her to the, her, the home so she has full-time care. I called the ambulance and, sh and they were there like this, like in a minute, like, it was like they were on the corner or something. And so suddenly from this, I don't know what I'm doing to wheeling her out of the room and then she's gone and I'm looking back at the apartment and going, she's never going to be in that apartment ever again. There's no more home. There's no more safety. There's no, like I, I, I'm literally sending her off to die on purpose, out, out of love, but on purpose. And this element of having a jury in the, in the show judging me was so poignant for me about me judging myself, you know, and I still haven't, I still don't know what, how I feel about it deep down because deep down I know I sent her out on purpose to die. Hard to give somebody, you know, send somebody off. And for the, the one thing you want least in the entire world, and you're praying for it. <laughs> ah! um, the element of the jury in the show allowed me to, I mean, it was a conversation with myself mm -hmm. about guilt, about yeah. responsibility, and about, and also ultimately about giving up, not giving up like losing hope, but just about giving in and, and just being with what is. Um, so I see why, I, I see why even more deeply right now, as we're talking, why the process of that show meant so much to me. You know, I was judging myself. I mean, I, st I still judge myself. I haven't let it go. Um, yeah. I don't know that I ever will. It just gets a little quieter, you know. Yeah. But yeah, that's the job <laughs> to to button the story. <laughs> Kevin, I so appreciate you being so honest. Well, I said nothing's off limits. <laughs> I, I think you should be very proud, and I can see your love and the way that you talk about your family. They must have gotten so much joy from you. I, good Lord. Now I you're going to make me cry. I'm not, <laughs> I'm crying now. Oh, Kevin. God. 
This is all good though. That's really good. What's your relationship with aspiring dancers? You know, these young, just born dancers, you know, uh, what's your relationship with them when they come to you and they're, Kevin, tell me, <laughs> tell me the secret. You'd be surprised how few people come to me and ask me what the secret is, but the ones that do, boy, do I give them a lot. Here's the thing. I, um, I was, I was always, I, and I still am quite shy. I know it's weird. It doesn't seem like I'm shy, but when, if I'm like at some place by myself, I can't, I have a really hard time introducing myself to people unless someone comes to me. Um, mm -hmm. And I, I, I fake it till I make it now, but back in my twenties, I didn't have those skills yet. So I was still very shy, even though being very professional and in my environment, I was also still very shy. But um, in the mid nineties, um, my friend Dominic Lucero passed away. And um, when, when I was just entering the dance community and my first audition for Debbie Gibson's Electric Youth, um, Dominic came outside right after the audition and said, hey, you're really good. What's your name? My name's Dominic. How are you doing? Blah, blah, blah. And he made a real point to tell me how good I was. He introduced himself. He, he said, you know, good luck. Um, I, hopefully I'll see you soon, blah, blah, blah. And he was the first LA, like, LA dancer that I ever met. And that act of kindness, just as Kareem said of me, has always inspired me to pay it forward to other dancers as well. So even un, unapproached, I will approach young dancers and say, wow, you're amazing. Thank you so much. And when I do that, it's to honor Dominic. And all, I mean, also for myself and to give and give and give, but it really ultimately in the background is to honor Dominic and what he did for me. Um, he gave me um, sort of the peace and strength and, and just the, the, a way to know that it's okay. Like you're in good hands, you're in a good community that it is a community, <laughs> that you're not just on your own, like, which is most of my life has always been, I'm ruggedly individual and on my own, and I'm living here on my own, and I'm over here by my own, I'm in Singapore by myself, I'm in Santa Fe on my own, I'm in, like, I seem like I was on my own always. And, yeah. uh, and when I got to the dance community, I found a family. And that's another reason why I just never really left. I love it. It seems like, your work is the vessel to get you in, to engage with people. Yes. <laughs> so, that you, you can actually, so that you can actually give what you really want to give from your life. Yeah. That's cool. That's, and that's actually, that's a really, really, that's really insightful because I don't know that anyone really called that out like that, but yes, absolutely. If you have truth in your movement and there's something real about what you're doing and you, you mean what you say every Movement is an opportunity for communication, and if it's not communicating something, then it's a missed opportunity. Those are the things that I have to teach and that I want to share, and it has nothing to do with seven and eight and one, two. Like, that's not, that's not going to give you anything of what I have to share, what the unique experience that I have to share. What I want to share is communication, and a lot of that is chatty, chatty, talking, talking, until you get it in your head how this is related to this and how you have to lead from here. So my real root, root, root comes from the instinct of movement, not mm. the training of movement. Is there a need to be relevant and have a new project or involved in, in something? Are you ever I mean, afraid it, to let it go too much? Be honest um, with me, Kevin. No, I am honest. I, I, yes, yes, because I, I, I will say that I, I do love having a new project. I get delighted by the sort of weird moments. Like, you know, now I'm on a, I'm on a pirate ship and a, you know, in a commercial for Snapple, like whatever. Like I get, I get excited by those little moments. Like, oh, I'm on, I'm on the beach just like a cowboy for, for, for vodka with rainbows all around me and getting married with my fellow gay cowboy. Like those, those are so much like those moments. Those are the Does moments. Has that really happened? Like, yes, it has really happened. <laughs> for, David, for, David LaChapelle, for David LaChapelle for um what's that vodka absolute vodka can I just do some like rapid fire questions and like quick answers Absolutely. sure just for fun sure. the most beautiful thing about yourself 
Uh, uh, Master. Uh, oh God. Um, uh, I never. I never think like that. Uh, um, I don't know, smile. I don't know. Um. <laughs> your biggest influence, fast. Uh, Prince. Yes. Best dance club in L.A. Oh, it was. Well, there were a couple. They're clo all closed now. But right now, it would be. Um, uh, what the fuck? It's the only club I go to. Uh, it's behind the kitchen. It's behind the kitchen. You've been in quarantine too long. At the standard. I know it's been. I, I have been quarantined too long. That's crazy. Uh, Giorgio's. Giorgio's. Uh, I'm not going very fast either. Who do you want to work <laughs> with now? Who do you want to work with work? next? Real, realistically, or maybe not so realistically? Uh, Bjork has always been on the top of my list. Um, I missed, I was supposed to be the associate choreographer for Dancer in the Dark. I, I turned it down so I could do, go on tour with Ricky Martin and, and write my own music. Um, I'm, so, I'm kind of bummed that I did because it was really the last dance thing that she ever did. Do you have a special little like secret place in LA, like a, like a little beach somewhere or some place that you feel like is like your place? <laughs> my yard. <laughs> your yard. Yeah, um, I, have, I have a very unique property. Um, and my, I own, I own the building, but my place is in the back with this little backyard and no one knows it's really down here. And uh, yeah, so it's my own little special place. It feels like I could be anywhere. If you look out the window, it kind of looks like you're in like Tuscany because that was the developer's concept in the twenties. He went to Italy and came back and wanted to create Tuscany in the Hollywood Hills. And so there's like a tower, like elevator outside and there's like all these 1920s sort of like Spanish buildings and things. So you could be anywhere in the world. It feels like it doesn't feel like you're in Hollywood at all. There's no, you know, rarely a helicopter that you don't hear any traffic. It's just beautiful and calm. So I can just go outside and imagine I'm anywhere. I really appreciate you and the questions that you asked, especially, and uh, invite everyone who's listening to ask questions of those that you love. Deep questions, not how are you today, but like really ask some deep questions because the, that's going to get you closer and more related to the people in your life. And I always go to the book that my grandmother gave me that's always given me peace. You know, Pastor, she gave it to me when my friend Gabriel died, and I, I kept it with me when she passed as well. And it was The Prophet by Khalil Gibran. And he has a, a passage about suffering and that the vessel of our joy is carved by our suffering. Say it again. The vessel of our joy is carved by our suffering, meaning that our capacity for joy is directly in proportion to how much we suffer. I always look at that as a very optimistic passage. It's just, it's just about the other side of the coin, you know? Mm -hmm. And when I'm in my darkest spaces, that's where I look. That and I also know that my darkest spaces and darkest times are the moments that I would never change for anything, only because of the wisdom and insight and heart and life and joy that they've given me in the end. The capacity for joy. I won't say the joy, because those difficult moments don't necessarily give you joy, but they give you the capacity for joy. They, they, you, they let you realize, like, from here, you, all this is, you start appreciating, like, ketchup. You appreciate a freaking jack-in-the-box burger. You appreciate the light coming through the window. You appreciate that you have, you know, that you have hands. Mm -hmm. Like, just, I, the, I appreciate that I can see all those things. And tell yeah. it, unless it, you, won't, you, wouldn't, you wouldn't necessarily even know that if you haven't, like, experienced mm -hmm. some loss. Well, thank you, Kevin. Thank you so much. Appreciate Thank you. It.